I'm making this video in response to a comment and a question on the BNK 500 tube tester restoration. The uh, viewer was having trouble with a negative voltage, the bias supply in this circuit, and asked what could be wrong. And unfortunately, the only answer the only accurate answer to that question is, unfortunately, it, sound, it sounds flippant because the answer is anything could be wrong. That is, you could have something misconnected, you could have a bad component, you could have more than one thing misconnected, you can have more than one bad component. The uh, There are a lot of reasons why something doesn't work, and troubleshooting is an interactive procedure. So uh, it's absolutely the worst way to, to use email to try to troubleshoot something, but I'm going to try to help that person and maybe in the process help uh, a few others, particularly people who are just starting out. Now, if you've watched my other videos, you know I'm a strong believer in beginners finding a mentor. I had one when I first started. It really made things helpful because there are a million questions that occur to you. If the person right there can answer the question, it's a quick process. If, on the other hand, you have to go to your email and send off a question and then the person reads it and doesn't understand what you're saying and asks another and so on, it becomes very frustrating. Mentors are a good idea and I've suggested before that you can probably find them through a local ham radio organization, a trade school, maybe just some friends that have been in electronics a little longer uh, or they may know somebody that's willing to help out. So let's take a look at this specific circuit and see if I can help with how you might go about troubleshooting. The the specific problem in, is, as I understand it, that the viewer is only getting negative 5 volts on this capacitor. Now, I assume that th this is the one they're talking about. They also mention that they are using capacitors that are five times the originals. That's not a good idea. The, the size of these capacitors were determined based on surge current through this uh, diode and the amount of load that the particular instrument is taking off of those capacitors. And so if the engineer chose 20 microfarads, which I believe they, is what's in this one, you should stick to within about 10% at the outside, maybe 20%. So if this is a 20 and you can't find a 20, go with a 22. But don't go with a 33 or a 50 or a 100 or anything like that because you're going to really upset the circuit. You may wind up shortening the life of the diodes. You may wind up with uh, other problems. So kind of stay with the general uh, rating that is in there. Now when it comes to voltage rating, you can usually go a little above. So for example, I think in this one, the BNK500, this is a 250 volt unit. In the day, a 250 volt unit actually could work up to about 300 volts. That's not true today. Today you really need to believe the voltage ratings. However, in this circuit, there's only about 150 to 160 volts on this capacitor. So a 200 volt capacitor could would probably work. But if you don't know how to compute the safety margins on this kind of thing, stick with what the original. The original was a 20 mic, 250 volt. If you can't find that, look for a 22 mic, 250 volt. There are occasions like these diodes where you have trouble finding a replacement. They just don't make selenium rectifiers anymore. Now you can find some new old stock on eBay and so on, but I don't recommend it because these were never very good. A modern silicon diode is much, much better. But the one of the problems with selenium rectifiers is the way they were marked. 
you notice that this rectifier is marked with the positive end here, and this one is marked with the positive end here. In other words, the positive is connected to the negative. I always found the markings on selenium rectifiers to be confusing. They were intended to show how you hook the rectifier up to produce a particular voltage. So, if you hook it up this way, you get a positive voltage here. If you hook it up this way, you get a negative voltage on this end. But, eventually you're going to find that if you really want to understand electronics, you need to understand electron flow. And in a diode, the electrons always flow against the arrow. So, in other words, in the diode itself, you're actually going from the negative voltage to the more positive voltage in this direction. If that confuses you, just remember that when you put in a diode, a modern diode, there will be a stripe on one end. That striped end is the, is the end with this bar in the uh, schematic. So look at the schematic, look for this bar on the diode. That's the end with the stripe. It's called the cathode. Connect that end here. Up here, this diode, the striped end is on this end. So in this case, connect the non-striped end to this point. So okay, the second thing that could be wrong is one or of these capacitors in addition to being too large, I'm assuming if they really are 100 microfarads, you should go back to like a 20 or 22. But notice that this capacitor is connected backwards from this capacitor. That is, the negative lead of C1 is connected to what is essentially ground or the other side of the transformer. But the positive lead of C2 is connected to the same point. Why is that? Well, because you need a positive voltage on this pin, and you need a negative voltage on this pin. So the capacitors are reversed just as the diodes are. So if you have these misconnected, you might want to check that as well. Let's suppose that you're having trouble, and you can't, you've checked your connections, you're using the right value, you have the plus of this one connected here and the negative of this one connected there. Correct value, correct voltage rating, you're still not getting the right signal. What I suggest you do is unsolder this end of this rectifier. Whether it's the selenium or you've replaced it with a modern uh, silicon diode. Disconnect this end, just unsolder it so it's sticking up in the air, and put your uh, a multimeter on there, set to a DC scale, and see what you read. You should read about negative 150 to 160 volts on this point. It might be a little more than that. Don't worry about the exact value, just that you're getting a fairly high negative voltage at this point. That tells you that you have this diode connected correctly and it is working as a diode. The, uh, you might also switch to an AC scale and, and check to see whether you have any AC voltage at this point. If you have a lot of AC voltage, in other words, it measures 100 volts or so, you probably have a shorted diode. If it measures a few volts, 8, or 10 volts or so, depending on the meter and, and the diode and so on. You'll get, you may get a little bit of AC voltage there, but very little. Then, and you do get a good DC voltage, then the diode is probably good. If you want to actually test the diode, the best way to do that is turn off the power, leave this lead disconnected, take your own meter and measure across the diode in one direction. Then reverse the leads. In other words, if you have the leads this way, do this to the leads. So that the black lead is where the red lead was before and, and vice versa. In one direction, you should get low resistance, that is, uh, through the diode. And in the other uh, direction, you should get high resistance. That tells you that the diode isn't shorted. Finally, 
I always stress that it's better before you go in and wholesale replace a bunch of stuff to check the circuit. So if it were me doing this restoration, what I would do is before I replace the seleniums or the capacitors or anything in the circuit, I would go in and measure this voltage and write it down. Similarly, I would measure this voltage and write it down. Then, if I replaced a capacitor or a diode and I measured this voltage and found something substantially different, I would know that it was what I just changed that caused the, the problem. In other words, I wouldn't replace this capacitor at the same time I replaced this one. I would check this voltage, then replace the capacitor, check it again, then replace the diode, check it again, then go to this circuit, check this voltage, replace the capacitor, check it again, replace the diode, check it again. That way you know that you're not, uh, that when something doesn't correspond, it's the last thing you did that you need to fix. So I hope this will help a little bit. Uh, I, it's very, uh, I guess you would say frustrating to not really be able to help people in real time. But frankly, for me to show someone how to troubleshoot, you really need to be in the same room with them so that they can ask questions and so you can guide them. For example, measure this. If that doesn't work, disconnect this. If that doesn't work, check this diode. If that doesn't work and so on. It's an interactive process. It's a little like uh, a friend of mine once said, you can't drive by email. Uh, you've got to have an instructor <laughs> teaching you how to drive or you wind up dead long before the email telling you, no, 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 don't do that, arrives. So, uh, both for safety reasons as well as for just simple sanity. Try to find a mentor. Try to take it slow. Don't wholesale replace everything. I know there are some people on eBay or on uh, YouTube who advocate just go in and shotgun everything. Well, they may get away with it. But in my experience, I have a devil of a time finding a soldering error where I thought I was replacing this capacitor, but I wound up connecting this lead down here instead of up there. And the circuit sort of works, but it sort of doesn't. And so I'm looking for a problem and I see this capacitor. It looks like a good capacitor. I take it out and replace it with another one just like it. It still doesn't work and the reason is I had it hooked to the wrong place. So try to do this systematically. Try to work with a mentor if you can and don't take on huge chunks of circuitry. Do it one step at a time, testing in between each step and I think you'll find that your restorations will go a lot more smoothly if you do that. So I hope this has helped. Well, once again, I realize it probably will not solve any particular problem that someone has with a circuit, and I don't think I can do that. But I can give you general troubleshooting tips and, and hope that these will help guide you in uh, finding your particular problem, but more importantly, learning how to go about troubleshooting in a systematic way. Have fun with your restorations, stay safe, and I'll look forward to seeing you in another video.